My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Tonight, celebrate the Lord as I make welcome Apostle Mike Oroko. you came to receive something you are sure it's not gathering as usual it's an honor to be here this evening to share fellowship with you in UNN I trust that the procession that the Lord is going to begin tonight would be a river that many of you that have been expectant of a revival will be carried along. As I stepped into the borders of your campus, I began to interact with prophetic energy. And the spirit of prophecy was hovering around the campus. And I realized that God is out on a recruitment campaign. There are many of you that have already been earmarked as hunters that the Lord will use in the last day and this is a kairos moment, it's a strategic season in the spirit and for those of you who are discerning you will realize that new sets of instructions are already coming in your direction it's because of what God is out to do it's not a season to play around it's a season to take responsibility for destiny and so this evening I've only come as a herald to stir up the waters so that that operation of the spirit that is already ongoing in your heart will receive momentum and power to bring you to that point where the embers and the wish passed from Zion will become discernible in your soul structure. Lift your hands toward heaven and worship the Lord now. The hour has come. The time has come. The Bible said Elijah waited. When the prophets of Baal were carrying on their stones, he waited until the time of the evening oblation. When there was no more voice, he said he called them and said, come close to me. And as they drew close to him, he said he picked up 12 stones consistent with the 12 tribes of Israel 
and he began to build the altar. The number 12 is the number of government. Because God was about to bring upon the landscape a new order of spiritual operation. The hour has come. Whisper to the Lord now and give expression to your expectation. If you have an expectation tonight, give it expression. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise, Lord. We give you glory. We ask, oh God, that there be a fresh visitation upon your people. That which you promised the fathers. That which the fathers prophesied. The covenants they entered into. The sacrifices of alignment that were put on ground to orchestrate a move of your spirit. The stirrings that have gone forth in the atmosphere. The alterations in the spiritual climate. So that sons of order can walk into the womb of the spirit. Father, tonight we align our spirit. become a distraction. You are sick. Something, you are pain, something connected to your body system and it's not functioning properly. Just place your hand. If it's an organ infection, a blood infection, just put your hand on your chest. No problem. Let's deal with sickness and forget about it so that we can do business that borders on our soul. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just play that song. Let the healing angels minister to you in the next two minutes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As you get sucked into that song, the healing power of God will touch you. As you get sucked, as you get sucked, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank 
you, Father. You are all healed in the name of Jesus. Just check your bodies. Check, check. Don't go religious with me now. Check your bodies. You had pain and the pain is gone. Just wave at me quickly. Let me see. You. Those of you who had infections, you had pain, you have sickness or something. If it's something you can verify, just check. Check your bodies. The next one minute. Check, check very quickly. If you have noticed a change, wave your hand at me. You have noticed a change already. Any other person, you've noticed a change. Wave your hand at me quickly. You've noticed, you've noticed a change. The healing power of God is already ministering to people. We need to put that aside so that it's not a distraction. Why with the message go on, you will discover most of you, the process is already on. By the time we end the service, you discover you are permanently healed. Because I may not have time to deal with this of sickness tonight. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to do a teaching tonight. By tomorrow, I will have the liberty to do impartation. But for tonight, I'm burdened to do a teaching. I'm going to be doing definition of terms this evening. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to be doing another brief teaching on the precursors of alignment. Then we'll do the impartation. But tonight, I'm going to do a definition of, of terms on what spiritual alignment is about. It's possible for us to be carried in the waves of the move of God. But we are not established in truth. It's possible for us to be carried away by the euphoria and the atmosphere of our gathering. And then we lose touch with the true essence and meaning of the gathering. It's possible for us to be sucked into the activities that characterize the move of God. But the life of the move itself is not planted in our spirits. And so tonight, I want to do a teaching to bring us into understanding of what the essence of alignment really is about. Because many people are using very big words because it seems as though the move of God that is coming to us at this time is to be activated by utterance. And on the strength of what God is doing, many people have reduced the spiritual essence of what's happening to talk, to lingo, and to big, verbosious words. But what God is doing is bigger than language. It's a move of His Spirit. And if you don't even understand why God is activating what He's doing by the way of utterance, you would not even know what and why utterance is a necessity. Utterance is not English language. It's not oratory. It's not dexterity in speech. It is a spirit-energized communication that connects the heart of the Father to the heart of His people so that the body in the heart of the Father can be transferred to the listeners. So when utterance is in full scale, what happens is that the people are quickened. A fresh hunger is activated in their hearts to begin a journey, the pursuit of God, in order to realize the full scope of their motivation. Then their life will have meaning. But if we reduce what is happening to talk and mastery of the nature of teachings that is flat around, we will become babes the more we think we are going in the womb. That's why Paul came and he diagnosed the condition of the churches in Corinth. And he said they were babes and they were carnal people. Why was that so? They listened to Paul. They listened to Apollos. So they could talk like Paul. They could talk like Apollos. They knew the set of teachings, but they had no contact with essence. And when you find such deficiencies in the body, it simply means that alignment is not an integral part of that which the Lord is doing. Because alignment 
is that which brings us into the experience of the mind of the Father. If you have not come into the experience of what God is doing, you may be juggling around in cliches and exciting your emotions. But in the day where champions are numbered, you would realize that you are not coming. In the day of trouble and affliction, you will realize that your strength is small because you never traveled into the womb of the Spirit. And that is why I want to show us this evening, very quickly, what alignment, spiritual alignment is about. Hallelujah. There is a place of understanding of what God is doing. And there is a place of transformation to become that which God is doing. There are two different things. You may come to a point where intellectually, cognitively, you have an understanding of what it's about. What the move of God is about. What God wants to do it's about. And then there is another place where you have become the move of God. The goal of God is to make you the move that is coming on the earth. Right? So that your life becomes the extension of his reality. It begins with understanding what God wants to do, but it doesn't end there. It becomes relevant when the people that have caught the light of what God wants to do become that which God wants to do. At that point, then the work of alignment is complete in their lives. Jesus made a statement, a very profound statement, in John chapter 9, verse 5. He said, So long as I am in the world, he said, I am the light of the world. It's possible for you to look at that scripture and then you also go in faith and begin to declare that you are the light of the world. And there is nothing wrong with it because one of the laws of faith is the law of speaking. The speaking law of faith is a very integral part of the realization of possibilities that are locked up in faith. But you need to understand that before Jesus made the statement that he was the light of the world, he went through a definite protocol to become a light. The Bible said he was led into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to be tempted of the devil. It was when Jesus passed the test of alignment that he returned as the light of the world. So Jesus was not just making a quote because it was intelligent to make a quote. Jesus was making a declaration from the essence of his reality. He was the word of God. He was the creator of all things. He was co-equal with the father. But he never called himself the light until he satisfied the demands of alignment. When he came out of the wilderness, the Bible said he returned in the power of the spirit. At that time, Jesus had the right to give himself as a light. So every spiritual reality will be alien to you until you satisfy the requisite alignment requirement in order to manifest the dimension of that reality. There are many Christians making declarations today of what they are not. They are thinking, saying it they will become. Saying it does not make you until you behold him as he is. And for you to come to the center and the womb of the spirit where you can look at him as he is, you must come under the government of the Holy Spirit. That's where many believers have lost out. They don't submit to the demand of alignment, but they declare the possibilities of faith. That's why we discover when we have crisis that we are deceived. We realize all of a sudden when there is calamity in our lives that we are deceived. You hear people saying they can do all things until Christ is come. That's when they realize that they were quoting scriptures that are not realities in their spirit. You hear people say they are full of the anointing and the power of God until their neighbor, their nephew, their brothers, their sister, or their mothers is sick. That's when you see believers running around looking for healing lines to join because they realize that the declaration they were making all the while was a lie. Am I talking down on faith proclamation? No. But I am telling you that apart from faith proclamation, there is a requisite alignment that every believer must join himself into in order to enter into the realities of the things that are spoken. Jesus, the Bible said, is the author and the finisher of our faith. So everything Jesus did was a gangway that he revealed to humankind that in order to become that which he is, then he must go in this path. Paul was the one that declared that we are the righteousness of God. But when Paul spoke to his disciples in 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 17, he told him, exercise yourself unto righteousness. Exercise yourself. It's no doubt
thought that you are the righteousness of God. But in order for the economy of righteousness to become a reality in your soul and in your body, there is something you need to do. The word exercise there is the word alignment. Christianity is not talking. If it is reduced to talking, then we become puppets in the hands of principalities. If it's reduced to talking, then we can be manipulated. A spirit that does not have law over you, you can never see his reality. You may talk about him, but you will not walk in his reality. That is the plague of many believers. Alignment is the heaviest molecule in the doctrine of righteousness. When we talk alignment, we are talking about the economy of holiness. We are talking about the full manifestation of the essence of God. And you need to understand that holiness is the business of the throne room. experience. If it's not an experience, then alignment is lacking. The issue is not because the promise is not meant for you. The issue is, have you commi committed yourself to the requirement to walk in this reality? Jesus! The Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 1, that in the beginning was the world. It said the world was with God. The world was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He said in him was life. The life was the light of men. When did Jesus become the light? After he fulfilled the demands of alignment. The promises will be there. But the experience is predicated upon alignment. Never come to a point where you psych yourself as a believer. You will set yourself up for destruction in the day of battle. What is alignment? The first thing you need to know is that alignment is the journey out of the womb of mortality to walk in immortality. Alignment is the ability of a mortal vessel to come to a point where he can host immortal realities and give expression to them. Alignment is not talk. Alignment is manifestation of reality. You are not aligned until spiritual possibilities begin to find expression in you. You can be a leader. You can be an apostle. It doesn't count. You can be a prophet. It counts for nothing. You may know the laws and the doctrine of righteousness. But you are not aligned to the reality of righteousness. Until your life becomes an emergence of the realities of righteousness. Alignment is the point where a mortal vessel begins to live like an immortal. Alignment is when corruption begins to host the possibilities of perfection and give expression to them. Alignment is when a man becomes a God. When people look at you and all they can see is Jesus, then you have entered into the womb of alignment. It's not a talk, it's a life. How do you come to that point where you can host and give expression to reality? These realities are there. They were promised to you for one minute. Don't be lost. Stay with me. Listen. Let me give you a scripture to substantiate the points I'm making. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, look at what the Bible said. It says, Have you not heard? Has it not been said unto you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? What is the Bible saying? It means the ability to continually dispense energy and not to faint is only possible in the divine. The ability to walk and not faint is only obtainable in the divine. Only God sustains the capacity to walk and not to faint. But in verse 31 of that scripture, it says you shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and you shall not faint. What is it telling you? It means there is a possibility for humankind to come to a point where he can do the things that the divine himself can do. That is alignment. If you come to that point where your life becomes they shall run and they shall not be weary. What has happened to that people? 
tell your neighbor, say it's alignment. If you find yourself walking, you may know. Because he said, have you not heard? That means it's possible to hear. Has it not been said to you? It's possible to know about it. But have you come to the point experientially, you are walking, you are not weary, you are running, you are not fainting. That's when alignment is achieved. There are many young people talking big things. Especially this media age now where everybody has a platform to talk. But when you come down and you step down into our lives, you will see how pathetic many people are. Because they talk what they don't experience. He said there is something you must pay attention to. He said you must wait on the Lord. That's the sacrifice. The difference between mortality and immortality is a place in the spirit. There's a place in the spirit where a mortal vessel travels to and because he stays there, when he comes out, his mortality is swallowed. Did you read about Moses? He said he stayed in Horeb, in the mountain of God for 40 days. And he said when he returned, he wished not that his face shone like the sun. So it's not something that you carry in your head. It's a reality that even if you are not aware of, so long as you have traveled to that place, everybody that looks at you is God they touch. Because you have entered a place where you journey past the gate of mortality and you are interacting with immortal entities. Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you? In your case, you may have heard. In your case, it may have been told to you. But are you running and fainting? Are you walking and, 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 and you are weary? It means you have not known alignment. The difference between mortality and immortality is a place. It's a day that wait. There are people that journey out of all of the proclivities of flesh and they come to that place where the Holy Ghost wants them to stay. That's why for Jesus, the Bible said that spirit drove him into the wilderness. There was a place Jesus needed to stay. And he stayed there until he apprehended the power of the spirit. So when he came back, he didn't talk grammar. He went straight into the synagogue and he said, <laughs> he began to talk like an immortal. Before that time, he was known as a carpenter. All he knew to do was the skill of carpentry. You may be here talking physics, medicine, microbiology. That's because your reality is still factored into secular intelligence. You have not stayed in the spirit enough. When Jesus returned, the Bible said he went into the synagogue as his custom was and he carried the book to read. And suddenly Jesus was reading scriptures. He was not reading it as if he was reading to people. He was reading it as a manifesto. What has happened? A mortal man has become an immortal. A mortal man had entered the place and everything that constitutes his frailty had been swallowed up. So the man shows up. He said, I come to preach the gospel. And how will he preach the gospel? He said, to give sight to the blind. Who gives sight to the blind? Are you alright? Do men give sight to the blind? He came to unstop deaf ears. To heal the broken hearted. What has happened? He went to a place. He went to a location that the Holy Ghost carried him to. You know, Jesus said, I have many things to tell you. But you can't receive it now. There are things that if you hear, your mortality cannot allow you bear it. He says, so how be it? In John chapter 16 verse 13, he said, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you to a place. He said, it's the place of all realities. Have you found that place? It is the journey of alignment. If all we have is talk, we are jokers. Because the princes, when they come, they don't care what you know. They are only interested in what you can manifest. He came to Jesus. He said, if you are the son of God. Their question is if. What can you manifest? If you say you are a believer, can you live without sin? If you say you are a believer, can you live without fear? If you say you are a believer, can you walk like the God that you profess? That's the question that the devil brings our way. And he doesn't bring it in articulate speech. He brings it to you as malaria. He brings it to you as fornication. He brings it to you as lying. He brings it to you as fear. The devil is checking whether you are still mortal or you are immortal. And the answer you give him is a statement of the location where you are standing in the spirit. Jesus said, the prince of this world, he come to me, he findeth nothing. The devil will come and check. He will not check what you are saying. He will check through your life. 
You say you are a believer. Here is everybody fornicating. What are you doing about it? Here is everybody sick. What is your experience? The reason we live like mortal men is because we have not committed ourselves to pay the sacrifice of alignment. Alignment is a journey from mortality to immortality. He said, have you not heard? Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not? Neither is he weary. Those are realities that are only manifest in God. Only God sustains the capacity of not being depleted. That's why his name is called the El Shaddai. The word El Shaddai means the multi-breasted one. He's the one that suffices everyone and his step is not depleted in essence. Have you heard about the El Shaddai? And then the El Shaddai himself made a statement. He said, they that wait upon me, a point come when they become like unto the El Shaddai. He said, they shall run, they shall not be weary. They shall walk, they shall not fail. What has happened? Mortality has been swallowed up. It's called the requisite sacrifice of alignment. You know, we think Christianity is about talking. So we gather ourselves and we impress ourselves. Meanwhile, the man, the world doesn't care what you do. He doesn't even notice you are talking. So you talk among Christians and you say things and they are clapping and you say, Ooh. Jesus didn't have time to talk among believers. He went to the market. He went to where the normal men are and he spoke and it was packed with power. Because when he came to speak, he spoke as a God. You are speaking as a man, but you want to act like a God. You are deceiving yourself. The only way to come to that point is to wait. That's when you can see him as he is. Because he said, if we see him as he is, what happens? We become like him. So the goal is transformation. Become like unto him. That's when you are a Christian. Christianity is not a title. It's a manifestation of a life. Who are you? We despise our likeness and we come to deceive ourselves in fellowships. No wonder we can't take our war. Tonight I want to keep it calm to challenge your conviction so that there will be a shift in your paradigm. We have made so much pride and bragged so much in titles. Our titles take us nowhere. Jesus didn't bother about titles. It was later they wrote about him saying he's a great shepherd. He said, I am the son of God. He was a man. Every time a title is added to him, his value is reduced. You will never hear prophet Jesus or apostle Jesus. Meanwhile, the apostolic, the prophetic is an effulgence of his reality. He said, who shall declare his generation? So the reason we are apostles is because we are an extension of him. So in his own conviction, an apostle is a manifestation of a dimension, not a title. An apostle is a witness and a proof that a kingdom that is an invisible realm exists in the natural. So when an apostle shows up, the bodies of the kingdom should manifest. So what makes you an apostle is not the title. It's your ability to bring the kingdom to bear. When you speak, what happens to people? A man is in the kingdom of darkness, but an apostle talks to him and he steps out of that kingdom and he enters another kingdom. That is an apostle. He has the ability to pull you out of another kingdom to what he represents. So long as you interact with him, you must bow to the government that is out. That is the definition of the apostolic. But it's for men who have seen life. It's a journey from mortality into immortality. The reason we do what we do is not to gain mastery per se. It's to become. Never master the art of prayer. Never master the art of reading. Become. So that you will be an expression of prayer. And that's when you pray, your prayer should be answered. Somebody say, a prayer warrior is not a man that prays so much. It's a man that has answers to prayers. Don't you see that we brag in mundane things? When people gather, they hail somebody because he prayed longer than every other person. Meanwhile, ten people came with cancer. No one was healed. And the prayer man is walking. He says, ah, oh boy, we're in a prayer. We're in a prayer. And your prayer cannot transform anything. What is the goal of prayer? Prayer is a bridge between, behind, between immortality and mortality. Prayer is a chamber, a gate, a bridge through which you can download possibilities that are in heaven. Somebody comes to say he knows all the doctrine of the Bible. Meanwhile, he's a puppet. He knows the doctrine of healing. He's sick. He knows the doctrine of righteousness. He's a sinner. Are you not a fool? Loftiness of the man. Little or no transformation in the, in the soul. 
Alignment is a journey from mortality to immortality. What is alignment? Alignment is fraternity with entities in Zion. A man of alignment is a man of encounters. Did you read about Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration? In Matthew 17 verse 2. He said after six days he took Peter, James and John. And he went to the mountain. There he prayed. What happened? First, there was transformation. He said the fashion of his continent was altered. His raiment glistered. And then something happened. He said they stood between Moses and Elias. What were they discussing about the things that will happen in Jerusalem? Because this man has come to a point where he has submitted completely to the will of the Father. So entities in Zion who carry the message for what God wants to do, they came to submit it to him. Elijah came to submit the prophets. Moses came to submit the law because this man has decided to pay the price for emergence of the kingdom. Because he submitted in alignment, the prophet and the law needed to come and submit their witnesses. Alignment is a place of spiritual fraternity. If you have not come to a place where you mingle with entities from Zion, it means your will is this strong. The day your will crushes for the will of the Father to find expression, you will walk into your room and you see an angel standing. The angels don't appear because they want to impress you. They come with witnesses. They are high commissioners of heaven. Angels don't come to gist with men. They come to carry out kingdom business. And it's only with men who are willing to drop their will for the will of the Father to find expression. Alignment is a place where we fraternize inside. That's when you interact with the spirit of just men made perfect. In 2013, I was serving. I sat from 212 to 213. And I moved to worry. And I decided to take a one year path and pray with pray. Those days were days when I go out two times in a week. Just to attend service on Sunday and to go for CDS Wednesday. And I was in the room there. I said, Lord, whatever you have me do, I will do it. If you tell me to die now, I will die. Ah, when you talk like that, you have triggered the jealousy of God in your direction. When you talk like that, you have begun to invoke the powers of Zion. And the first thing the Lord did was that a hand came into my room. That was when I began to have the craziest encounters. These are things I cannot substantiate by doctrine. And it carried me and I found myself in the room of Reverend Chris Yuakilome. And I discovered Reverend Chris Yuakilome was 17 years old. How is that possible? I had a time travel. I went back to time. I was carried to a time that I was not yet born. Because I said, now whatever you have me do, I will do it. I was not praying for encounter. When you yield yourself to the will of the Father, you have actually triggered the protocol of encounter. And then he showed me, look at how he lived his life. He said, this is how a man of God should live so that he can manifest the dimensions of God. And I saw the way the man lived his life. That was when I knew that if I'm at home, my door should be locked. I'm in business because I saw that the priest never opens his door. He was always in door. What was he doing? Crying for nations. I said, is that how this thing works? Or when lives with me, my door is always locked. Sometimes he goes out, they ask him, why don't this your brother come out? I saw it in the spirit. And so long as I'm in door, I have authority to guide my soul. And every time I come out, I'm a candidate of fire. I saw it in the life of Pastor Chris. I didn't read it in the book. He showed me how he lived his life as a 17-year-old boy. He showed me 25 things that the man did as a lifestyle. I have not reached a point where I can obey those things. The day I obey those things, I will become a man of wonder. Because I saw it. The first impartation I received from a general was in the spirit. You can, through alignment, enter somewhere where you meet even people who have died. Because their anointing is still in this world. Did you read Songs of Solomon chapter 4 verse 4? It says, in the ears of Zion, there are shields of many mighty warriors. You can, through alignment, enter a place... I saw the man of God in the spirit and he looked at me. He said, take what I have. And as he touched me, I rode over 50 meters. And I said, thank God. Pastor, please don't impact me. I didn't know whether I was in the spirit or in the body. I began to have crazy encounters because I said, Lord, whatever you have me do, I will do it. It was in that place of alignment that God carried me to a mountain and I met Bishop Oedeko. And then he asked me, say, what do you want? I say, I want, teach me, I want the way of love. And 
and then he said, you have it. People who live around me think I'm crazy. I give like a madman. I don't give what I have to spare. I give the things I value. It's not because I learned it. It was imparted to me by Bishop. When I came out of that encounter, I almost cried. I said, why did I ask for faith? <laughs> you see, when you are in your senses, you are deficient. I said, why did I ask for faith? How can I meet Oedeko and I'm asking for, for love? It was later that I heard him preach. And he said, men don't know him. He said, faith walked by love. He said, he's a man of love. That was when I began to hear how Bishop Oedeko will be in church when they started. He will look at the brother. He said, the person looks hungry. He will say, tell that person to meet me after service. And they will empty all his money and say, he doesn't even know how much it is. Meanwhile, he's not going home with the hope of what to eat. Today, you see him flying in private jet. And then you are talking. I met them in the spirit. I interacted with them in the realm of reality. Before I ever went to them to impart me, I had received impartation in the spirit. Because alignment is a ground of spiritual fraternity. Many will never enter into great things because their will is still strong. When you journey from the gate of mortality to immortality, there are many possibilities that you can express. Alignment is a journey into mingleness, oneness with God. Oneness. Many people are crazy about encounters. They don't know the things that matter. Crying, they want to see angel. They want to see archangel. They want to see this person. Don't waste your time. Pursue after God. Alignment is a pursuit of God. It's a pursuit of God for who he is. Did you read John chapter 20? From verse 3 to verse 16. They ran to the tomb of Jesus. John and Peter, they came. They saw the linen cloth and they were happy. They ran away. But Mary Magdalene stayed. And people will tell you, I was praying and my leg began to hurt. My hand was shaking. What does it mean? What do you mean? God is luring you into the spirit in case you want to know what it is. <laughs> Did you not read where he said, he has given you great and precious promises that by them you may escape the, the corruption that is in the world through love. Having become partakers of the divine nature. Those things are triggers to bring you into his presence. But John and Peter, they saw linear and they left. Mary Magdalene stayed. She stayed. And then she saw two angels. And she was not part of the way because she saw angels. How many of us come to preach and say, ah, the last time in Gabriel showed to me, show up in my room. She stayed there. The angel said, why are you troubled? She said, where have you kept my Lord? Where have you kept my Lord? And Bishop was God. Not a man that God can commit heavy things to their hands. And suddenly Jesus showed up. She looked at Jesus. She didn't recognize her. She's this day. Because until she meets the Jesus she knows, she's not going anywhere. And Jesus looked at her and said, Me. And she said, Rabona. That was when her hunger was satisfied. Some of us are satisfied too quick. Because the reason we cry for encounter is because we want to tell our friends that we too have seen angels. God is not our priority. Our goal was not to tell the world that she has seen angels. She said, Rabona. That was when her lust was satisfied. Because alignment is a journey into oneness with God. Jesus prayed in John 17. He said that they might be like us, one with us, as I and thee are one. You want to conquer your world? You want to host the dimensions of God? You want to take over your territory? Oneness is the key. A God you are not one with, you can never mirror his dimension. Deceive yourself. The principalities will watch out and they will fashion a weapon that is meant for you and you alone. You do not hear it say no weapon fashion. It means they, they take the time to design a weapon that is consistent with you alone. Even if they shoot it from Hades, it will locate you because your appetite will attract it. But when God becomes your only appetite, you become invisible in the realm. Because before they get you, they will find God. That's why Paul said we are hid in Christ. He said the life we have now is the life of the Son of God. He said we are hid in Christ and Christ in God. How does that happen? He said when your affection is in the things from above. 
If your affection is turned on God only, a point come when a oneness is so achieved that they can't find you. Everything they want to talk about you, they will talk about God. They do this about Daniel. He said they looked for an occasion against him. They couldn't find any except, except in his law, the law between him and his God. So you can't find them. Before you hit such a man, you will first of all conquer God. That's why the Bible says we are more than conquerors. Because before you come to us, you must fight the one that, that defeated principalities and powers. They are not speak just to quote their experiences of life from men who have journeyed in the pursuit of God. What have you done to pursue the Lord? Many of us have terrible appetites and we deceive ourselves so much. We deceive ourselves. We think God is pleased because we are doing things in the kingdom. If we don't ask for all love in your waste. It's love for him that is his first priority. He said they came to him. They said, we sucked with you. He said, we heard you preach on our streets. We did miracles in your name. He said, away from me, walk us from the deep. Because everything they knew about the Lord was in the flesh. They never knew him in the spirit. Because he took a price to join into the spirit. They thought because they saw him in Galilee, they could do what he's doing. That's why Paul said, henceforth, no we, no man after the flesh. He said, we knew Christ in the flesh, but not anymore. We must all come and pay the price of staying in the presence until his dimensions are revealed to us. And it's the dimension of God you see that you can mirror. We are not called to all do the same thing. It is who you see that you will reveal. It's dimension that you see becomes the light that you reveal to your world. That's why I say that light is the true light that lighted every man to come into the world. What dimension of light have illuminated you? If you see his law, you will reach your world through his law. If you see his faith, you will reach your world through his faith. If you see his power, you will reach your world through his power. If you see his wisdom, you will reach your world through his wisdom. All of us read the whole Bible. But go and listen to the men of God that are doing next stuff. Everything Bishop Wade could preach is ending it because the God he saw is the God of it. Everything they preach, everything Apostle Aaron preaches ends in kingdom. The God he saw is a government. Who have you seen in the spirit? It means you have not traveled far enough. You have heard what men said and you are psyched. And then because you are the head of fellowship, you want to make create a caricature so that people will think you are what you are not. The principalities don't see your action. They see the light you emit in the spirit. So you may deceive men, but you can't deceive spirits because they dwell in the realm of reality.
That's how realities are known in the spirit. He said the things we heard, we saw, we looked upon it and we handled of the word of life. He said that's what we have come to commit to you. So for John, the message they preach is not something they read to preach. It's a reality they have. Present our custodians and they are coming to commit it. So when Paul, John speaks to you, he's committing God into your hand. Do you read what the Bible said in 1 Timothy 2 verse 2? He said the things that you have received from me. He said they say commit to faithful witnesses who shall be able to teach others. So they don't have God in their head. They have his reality in their spirit. And they have the capacity to give you God. So when such a man comes to preach righteousness, sin will be tamed in your life. Because he is committing to you the spirit of righteousness. When such a man comes to teach wisdom, foolishness will be exonerated from you because he came to commit to you wisdom as a substance. That's where they stand in the spirit. That's who they are. And that's why they were able to change their world. It's the journey of a life. You travel from mortality and you begin to experience the dimensions of immortality. You come to a point where you fraternize with realities and entities in glory. That's when true authority can be committed to your hand. And the reason these things are locked in the spirit is so that they cannot lend themselves to men cheaply. Only men that sought after them can have them. How desperate do you sought after God? You pick a message here and there and you say you have become a preacher. You are a joker. But John, the Bible said he was in the wilderness. Luke 1 8 until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. He knew he needed to lay hold on something. This thing is not story we are telling. They are not storytellers. The Bible is not story we read to tell other people. They are realities that have impregnated us until they have changed our appetite. They have changed our ambitions. They have changed our proclivities. So we come as witnesses. John said when he pleased the Father, Galatians 1.13, to reveal the Son in me. So when John encountered Jesus, it was not enough. He needed to handle the reality. So the Bible said he went to the wilderness of Arabia. He stayed there for long until Christ was revealed in him. Those were the depths they went in God before they came to preach the gospel. We have babes on the altar. That's why there are confusions everywhere. People who have not handled anything, they come to talk. And they confuse innocent people. Innocent people who are seeking God genuinely. They come to tell them, it doesn't matter what you do, there's forgiveness in Christ. Are you alright? Who told you it doesn't matter? Your statement would have been correct if life ends only in time. But Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are all men most miserable. There is life hereafter. And in that life hereafter, what you do matters. You'll be rewarded based on what you do. And the reward of some people will be gnashing of teeth. Go and read Revelation chapter 20. After hell and death and the people that sinned were cast into the lake of fire. The Bible said in the new Jerusalem, it said some were in outer darkness. Who told you there is no consequence? People who don't know truth because they've not seen it in the spirit. They read stories. They thought it was about stories. You need to pursue after God so that you can see the one who is the true light. Paul said when he was praying for the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. He said he prays that God will grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He said that the light, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. You can talk wisdom by studying because the word is Sophia. is the ability to gather knowledge and to analyze it. You can pursue God to a level and then you enter into revelation. It's called the apocalypse, the unveiling. But that the realm is unveiled does not mean you know. Because if there is no light in this room, everything in this room will be in place, but you will be useless here. The mic will be useless. The keyboard will be useless. The reason you can interact is because there is light. In classical physics, you see because an object emits light. It's the light the object absorbs and emits that make you see it. Because the light travels to your eye. Your eye decodes it. Send it to your brain to decipher it before your brain sends response. So if there's no light, you can't see the chair. The realm can be revealed, but until the 
eyes of your understanding is illuminated. That one comes to people who wait. How long are you willing to wait? How long are you willing to stay until your mortality is swallowed up? Because alignment is revealing the dimensions of immortality in the mortal vessel. How long are you willing to stay? We come to fellowship and even fellowship has become a place to fertilize demonic appetites. Because the guy likes dancing. If he comes to fellowship and there's no dancing, the fellowship was useless. And then we dance the same dance steps we dance in clubs. Because there is no man that comes with the spirit of holiness. The day holiness comes to that fellowship as a revelation, everything you do in the flesh will be judged. Many preachers talking Bible but have no reality because they've not seen light in the spirit. The journey of alignment is the journey of oneness with God until his full dimension becomes your reality. How deep have you traveled? It's not enough to lift your hands in the prayer and because you are spinning and you are excited, you think you have taught something. John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He even heard a voice. But when God wanted to do business with him, another voice came and said, come up here. There are places in God. And for your mission to be satisfied, there's a place you must travel to. Instructions are in different spiritual strata. That's why the day you gave your heart to Christ, you didn't need a spiritual experience. That level of faith was dealt to every man. But if you want to know whether you are a prophet, it's in the height, in the spirit. So alignment brings us into strata where we can make contact with the essence of ordination. That's why a lot of Christians are confused. They have not traveled to where the instruction of their destiny is. I was talking with my friend day before yesterday. I told him, the instruction God wants to give you next day, you can touch it today. If only you will travel deep enough. Because the reason is in next day is because cumulatively, your spiritual energy is next day, it will take you there. But the spirit realm is not governed by time. What man Lee said, if you increase the time of waiting in the presence, he said possibilities of the future can be passed into the presence. It's an intelligence in spiritual work. How long are you willing to stay? Men can't tarry. They are willing to talk. All of us are jumping, saying there is revival. Have that revival begun in your life? You are not on fire. Who can you set on fire? Are you not a joker? He said the fire on the altar must not be put up. The priest's responsibility is first of all to keep the fire burning. How much of fire do you have? Because the protocol of alignment is oftentimes truncated. The God you've not seen, you want to manifest. How will you begin it? God is not read out to people. God is not taught to people. God is committed to people. He's committed. And only custodians of reality can commit his dimension. Alignment is a journey into heights in the spirit where the whispers of our delusion can come to us. If you are still here and you don't know who you are or what God has called you to do, the problem is alignment. Because the instructions of your destiny, they are in a place. Until you get there, you can't find it. A preacher cannot tell you that. Because God put it there so that when you get there, as you are knowing it, the ability to do is also important. Ezekiel said, I was in the 30th year. In the fourth month, in the fifth day, I was among the captives by the river Kabar. I saw visions of God. And as he spake, the spirit entered into me. When you know your ordination, the ability to fulfill is granted. That's why you cannot find ordination until you are lying. Because the instructions of your destiny, they are in the height in the spirit. And until you join it there, the ability will not be there. A prophet may come and tell you and say you are a prophet. And give you your name and when you were born. But you will go about living a wasteful life. There's a place you get to where your eyes are washed with eyes are. There's a place you go to where your ears are open. Because you begin to interact with new sets of energy. You are a one of wisdom. You can never function by the wisdom of the divine. Unless by alignment you go to the womb where wisdom dwells. He said to Job, do you know where light dwells? The scriptures cannot be unveiled to you until you journey to the place where light dwells. The man that see through the scripture, they talk from a place. It's a place where light dwells. That's the realm of illumination. Men of power, they journey to places. There are places in God. And the place that is consistent with your destiny is your responsibility to travel there. Unfortunately, many will never journey there. They will only be told the stories of God. And the time will come when they will discover they were deceived. 
What do you think they would have told John the Baptist? Imagine if John was in a church where a prosperity teacher was teaching. And say you must prosper in this life. Christianity has no value unless there is prosperity. The assignment of John, prosperity is alien to it. Because prosperity will be a distraction for John. The only way he will know is to stay in the wilderness. So no preacher could preach to John. His father was a priest. But what he needed to hear for his destiny, he needed to see the one who dwells in the midst of the pools of fire. And he said, the one that sent me, same said unto me. It was not a preacher that told him. There was no prophet in Israel for 400 years. How would the guy come and speak? He needed to have an authority that can pierce through the heart of people. So they said he was a burning and a shining light. Where did he contact that fire? Because in his destiny, fire is supposed to be part of it. Even if his father told him you are the one to herald the Messiah, how will he get the fire? He must travel to the spirit to be set ablaze. He showed up. They said, why are you baptizing? He said, the one that sent me said, upon him ever the spirit descend and rest. He is the Messiah. So for him, baptism was a strategy. Who taught him so much wisdom? He journeyed into the womb of life. Where are you standing? Elijah said, before God, who might stand? So he's not a prophet because he was born a prophet. He's a prophet because there's a place he stood in the spirit. And if Elijah can only stand there, when he speaks, heaven will back him up. If only Elijah will stand there, he can know the mind of God. Moses ran to him. He said, why do you cry? Go forward. How can a man hear God in such a split second? Over three million people are holding insult at you and you throw your face and instantly you begin to commune with the God of Zion. Is it God that is so easy to talk to? What has happened to the man? He dwelt in the wilderness for 40 years until he came to Horeb. God himself taught him how the wisdoms that open the veils of the divine are activated. So in the midst of three million people insulting him, he can still access the voice of God. And he says, stretch forth thy rod. It was not written in any book. How did he know that stretching the rod can part the Red Sea? It is by alignment. Where are you standing? Demons can come into your house and enslave people. When you are there, it's a shame. You are telling God, come, come. Why did God plant you there? You are there because you are the representative of God. God is already come because you are there. But what price are you willing to pay to be able to give expression to the dimensions of God? You are the one who is the plague of the family. Because by ordination you are the priest over your family. But you don't want to take responsibility. We live for our appetites. We live for our proclivities and our tendencies. And we think we can change the world like that. It's a deception from darkness. Alignment is your ability to journey to the place where the instructions of your destiny can be handed out to you. Many have not found it. If you are a pastor and you talk to preachers, you will know what I'm talking about. Over 90% of believers don't know what they are born to do. The moment they sense that God walks through you, they're everyone. Lord, man of God, what does God want me to do? Who told you it's a man of God that told me my own? The people you are talking to, who told you it's a man of God that told them? Have you ever heard anybody who say, a man of God told me that God called me? You will hear them tell you, say, God told me. God told me. The prophet who said, the word of the Lord came to me. That's how men are, their destinies of men are revealed to men. The destinies of men are not given to others to give to them. God gives it to them. He said, he called them to be with him so that he may send them. If you are not with him, you can't know why you are called. Alignment is journey to where the instructions of your destiny are. That's when you can change your world. Many people, I pity a lot of people. When you are 28, do cancer. You can bob your head and go friction. A day will come when there will be no hair to fit. That's when you realize you have wasted your life. That's why our fathers, the moment they retire, they die. Because they never found the meaning of life. When they sit down, they discover they were enslaved for 35 years. So that time, the void of destiny becomes so large. So they sit and they look back. There is nothing in their life that counts. Only regrets. So three years after retirement, they die. They didn't leave. Men of purpose don't retire. Because purpose is life. They found it in the spirit. They will carry Ken Hagen into meetings. They will be holding him like this. As he's laughing, the bomb will explode. Even when he couldn't carry himself, he emitted power. Power that even electricity will respond to. 
People were carrying him. But when he laughs, a whole congregation will begin to laugh. He set them drunk in the spirit. He found his identity. He found his identity. That's why these men of old, they, they live like Colossus. Jacob who want to die. He said, gather up me, you sons of Israel. Come around, I will tell you the things that will befall you. How do men speak like that? Isaac will tell Jacob. He said, I bless you with corn and wine. What happens to the law of inflation? How about unemployment? It doesn't matter. That man has journeyed into alignment and he knows he's a patriarch. If only he speaks, God will respond. He said, I will bless you with corn. That guy can never lack. Because a man of alignment is talking. And when he talks, he backs him up. Gather around me. You sons of Israel. He said, Reuben, you are the beginning of my strength. You have an excellent wisdom. He said, but as unstable as water, you will not prosper. It doesn't matter if Reuben has a doctorate degree. The word that the man has spoken will bound him forever. As unstable, you will never prosper. That's an alignment man talking. When he speaks, the mind of the father can be trafficked through him. When he stands, it's the government of Zion that is standing. That's how men live their lives in the days of old and they counted. The right of the firstborn, he gave it to Judah. He says, so long as you live, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Silo come. God in heaven respected it. Leadership was the right of the first son. But a prince, he handed it over to Judah. How did he get there? By alignment. Because the angel wrestled with him. Until his tendencies were broken. He wrestled with him overnight. Until his ambitions were broken. He said, he taught his title. And from that day when he leaned on the staff, he said, as a prince, thou hast power with God and have prevailed. The day you yield is the day you prevail against God. Because that day, you can become a witness on earth. Many people think, this, think what we do is preaching to educate people. We are witnesses. Beyond what we say, spirit enters. And that's why God deals with men before he sends them out. God doesn't throw men on the pulpit. Only, only babes jump on the pulpit. Every time you come on the pulpit, you know it's a body. Because you must first of all find the mind of the Father. That's when what you are doing will strike a chord in eternity. Else, in the radars of Zion, you will not appear. You will be shouting like a clown. But you will not appear in the radars of Zion. Alignment is the heaviest molecule of our work with God. And we must do everything it takes in order to be one with God. We must do everything it takes in order to leave our natural abilities and take advantage of the abilities of God. For Jesus, he was the world. The Bible said at the age of 12, he grew in wisdom, in knowledge, and in stature before God and before man. So at the age of 12, Jesus was qualified to preach. He asked the doctors of the law, so they couldn't answer. He was the one that answered them. But he knew that preaching is not about knowledge of the head. Preaching for him is a witness. So he waited on God until the day of his announcement. What are you doing? The burdens the Lord put in your heart. What are you doing with them? Every day you come you to church, you judge. You have written all the doctrine. You have read a thousand books. What is your life speaking? Until you begin to yield to the Holy Ghost to carry you to that place where you can become one with the Father. Your life will not count. Life begins to count when men are able to mirror the dimensions of God. Life begins to count when men become one with the Father. Else, we will live for the things of the flesh. And we will be beings of our appetites. I came this evening to challenge your conviction. I came this evening to scream as a herald. So that somebody will hear. Because the things that matter about your life, they are the transactions that are carried out in the secret place. What we do in the public is an overflow of the realities in the secret. If everything about your life becomes what is happening in the, in the, in the stage, then you are shallow. Every wind can throw you off. Alignment is a journey to the womb of life. But many have not traveled. How deep have you traveled, brother? I know you are a fellowship president. 
But how deep have you traveled? Before we begin to talk deep matters, where are you standing? Or are you talking what somebody has heard? What have you heard from the mouth of God? He said, man shall not live by bread alone. What have you heard from the mouth of God? That's why your destiny is strange to you. That's why you don't know where you are going. That's why you don't know tomorrow. But when you interact with God, something happens to you. You become like Him. You begin to see from His plane. He told Abraham, lift up your eyes. He said, whatever you see, as far as your eyes can see, I have given to you. Why do you think Abraham will be bold enough to tell the king of Sodom? He said, I will not take a latchet from you. Because he knows he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Even the thing the king of Sodom had with us. I will not take a latchet from you. Unless you say you make a, made Abraham it rich. Because the God of heaven have told him. He says, so as far as your eyes can see, Sodom was included. But some men pursue after things. Like Lot that saw the sides of Jordan and it was full with green vegetation. He didn't know that some years to come, fire will alight in Sodom and Gomorrah. Alignment is the direction to go in life. Alignment is that point where you submit your will to the will of the Father. Alignment is that point where you decide to put away your natural advantage and receive the set of advantages that you have in the Spirit. That's when your life will begin to count. Alignment is your ability to stand in the presence of God. Alignment is not doctrine. Alignment is life. Doctrine is important because it is within the boundary of doctrine that our heritage is preserved. But if we stop there, we will only be theologians and lecturers. And we bow our heads and pray. I was given a rigid instruction about time. I want us to pray a bit. That's why I'm stopping now. If tonight, I discovered it's just a charge I can give. It's just a charge. That's why I didn't, I couldn't look through my script. It's just a charge. You can sit down, but we'll pray. We'll pray in the next, in the next 10 minutes. And I will release some bodies. Tonight I came to show you where God expects you to stand. I came to show you something tonight. That life is beyond talking. I came to show you that there is a spirit expectation of you. God has an expectation. It's not every day we come and then there is fire everywhere. People are shouting. Sometimes we need to check our convictions. Sometimes we need to prove and find out where we are really standing. Go ahead and speak in tongues. As you speak in tongues tonight, pray intelligently. You know the area of your disobedience. You know the area of your disalignment. Ask the Lord to show you help. Ask for help. Ask for help. Ziso prote e kote ina kluche ba aile katondra aki so prate ina ikanta kemote etirus aito glahanaki esto preki ina obra akopani esida sunete endro e paraiko ta ile ke pasiza ilaite kalaito ariene matonge ilaika barina no sina maraita. The Libra in the clay in the Uneva, Opre in the Clora Catone, a suplete de Loprehida, Waria to Capa Raita, Impetone Capalina Cailo, Ia to Paratina Cusisi, a Sindre Iata Hoba, Pate Cabo, and Roga de Menatle Hida Glani, the Rado Sisimenate, Iadora Capante Tale, the Capanacone Caparita Uleta Isla. Come on, man, I'm the brownie, glitter, sunrise, heat up. Yeah, Papa, I'm the 
Because your territory needs it now. In order to bring the territory to a place of resonance where dimensions can begin to flow. Father, in the name of Jesus, it's time to receive now. Father, in the name of Jesus, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, we are the custodians. Touch them. I activate you now. I can see a lady in yellow in the spirit. A lady wearing a yellow top in the spirit. The Lord is about to activate a prophetic sound. From this lady, I see a yellow color in the spirit. Holy Spirit. We are the custodians. I release fire. From the left to the right. From the front to the back, 
Holy Ghost, touch them. Sabata, Jeli Barana Tos, Kambra Sateteria Tanas. If you are sitting close to somebody on the path, God is touching the person. Just help the person so that they are not injured. There is a fire coming to this building now. Belletete, Moria Natata, Mante, Berento, Sabrina Tat. Where are the custodians? The custodians. I activate a sickness in your spirit. I activate the gifts in your spirit. I activate the dimensions of God in your spirit. Take, 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 take. Ay, 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 ay. Baratapaponas. Telele tete. We are the custodians. I release power to unlock you. To unlock you. I release power. I release power. That's what them let them come down where they are. I don't need to bring them forward. Listen, listen. There's a second measure coming. I say they are custodians. They are people that carry sounds in their womb. Prophetic sounds. Some of them are carrying utterances of power. It's locked there. And I stir the fountains of the deep. I stir the fountains of the deep. I stay it. I stay it. Let the river flow. Hey, hey, hey. Tarapatanata. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Listen. The angels are still ministering to them. But you don't be distracted. Just stay focused. The, set, the second set of people, the hand of God will be touching now. These ones are leaders. They are in the order of what the Bible called the sons of Isaac. They understand patterns. They understand seasons. They understand timings. These ones are prophetic intercessors. You will not just pray, but you will see it. You will see the body. You will see the body. And right now, in the name of Jesus, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, I activate prophetic intercessors. Prophetic intercessors. Hey! I activate them. Help the brother. I activate prophetic intercessors. Prophetic intercessors. Prophetic intercessors. Prophetic intercessors. Manda paretetes. Riana tata. La tarida separate. Perido. 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 Setene talita. Hey, hey, hey.
want to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. You have been motivated by your desires, motivated by other ambitions. But today you want to say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. As it pleases you, so will I. Place your hands on your chest. Today I'm more interested in the business of souls. You want to become a battle act in the hand of God. You have attended many great meetings. You have seen power. You have seen all kinds of things. But is it not enough that every meeting you come for, you want to see power. But there's no transformation. You want to commit your heart, your life, your soul, your body to the Lord. It's a different thing to receive the life of God and to give your life to God. When you got born again, you receive the life of God. But when you want to serve the Lord, you give your life to Him. So that He can have the right of way. He can regulate what you eat, when you sleep, who you make friends with, even the job, who you marry. He will have authority. That's what you are making. That's the commitment. 
Say, Lord, I commit my life to you today as a token. You have to say it to me. I commit my life to you today as a token. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. You see, the Holy Ghost will begin to show you areas of disobedience. Even now. As the Holy Ghost reveals to you, repent. Repent. Tell him to help you. That's what you submit. That's submission. The Holy Ghost will be showing you the times when you committed my practice. The times you lied. The times you rejected the, the government of the Holy Ghost. He will show you now. Repent. Repent. So that he can have authority over you. I Is the time to submit it on the table. Drop it on the altar. Some of us is weakness. Drop it on the altar. Thank you, Father. And so, dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus, you said no man that cometh to you will you in any wise cast away. These ones have come to cleave to the horns of the altar. And so right now, I ask for a freshness of your spirit. As I stretch my hands towards them, let there be a release of life now. A release of life. A release of life. To swallow up their areas of weaknesses. Receive life. Receive life. The breath of the Holy Ghost. The breath of the Holy Ghost. The breath. Some of you are going to receive a fresh baptism now. You find yourself praying in the spirit. You find yourself prophesying. It's a new life. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. I activate the supernatural dimension that was locked up in your bowels. I activate it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Do we have an arrangement for this? Week? Do you have an arrangement for them? How do we do it? Those of you that have made this commitment, please try as much as you can. Go to the back. For those that are crying, the Lord is working on them, brother. When they can, they will join us. I just walk straight through this high to the back. Give your name. I will pray on those names. We will bring those names to the altar tomorrow. We pray on those names and they will become covenant before the Lord. Hallelujah. So just file to the back and write your name. Tomorrow will be a power service. I will come tomorrow as a revivalist. that you only heard about. Make it a date. Be here tomorrow early. If you can fast and pray, fast and pray before you come. Come light. Come light. God in the house. I'm here with my friend, Pastor Victor. And of course, all the officers. It's a challenge to do ministry in a military environment. Because these guys are weaved. So there's too much discipline in their lives. So if they say five minutes, when it's one minute to the time, you already been notified. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. 
salute all the officers in the house this morning. And in the short period of time that we have, we trust God to say something to us that we we touch the very depths of our hearts, where our meaning and our essence is locked. So that on the strength of that which the Lord will be doing, we will live here fresh and motivated for a new phase of our walk with God. Our anchor scripture this morning is Luke chapter 18 verse 1. And the Bible said he spake a parable unto them to this end. It says men ought always to pray and not to faint. You see there are certain scriptures that has a depth that is beyond the subject matter that is being considered. Sometimes when the spirit begins to talk, it's important for you to hear the things that is not saying that is part of the subject matter. Because the utterance of the spirit or of a spirit is crafted from his realm. And it will be difficult for you to discern what a spirit is saying by face value. Unless you are able to understand the depth and the scope of the reality of that spirit. If you interact with a spirit on the basis of face value, you may not fully articulate the body that is in the heart of that spirit. And on account of your inability to articulate the body in the heart of that spirit, you may think what the spirit is saying only addresses the subject matter. But what you don't know is that even after the subject matter is addressed, that utterance that came from that spirit is supposed to become a philosophy for your life. So when a spirit gives you a prescription, a doctor can give you an antibiotic because you have cough or you have some form of crisis. And the moment that crisis is handled, the use of that antibiotic is, is, is done and over. It is not the same with the spirit. So when the spirit comes to you and say, pray, you may have a challenge on ground and you think the reason you have to pray is to deal with that challenge. Meanwhile, that challenge that came to you was just an alarm system for you to enter into an economy that will define the meaning of your life. So the spirit took advantage of that situation to expose you to a syllabus upon which the essence of your life is designed. And until you begin to interact with what that spirit said as an eternal strategy for your life, you may not maximize it. And this is why sometimes we study the word of God. People go to pray when they are sick. And when they are healed, they think prayer is over. They study the word of God to deal with a challenge. And when the challenge is over, they think it's enough. And then the spirit that is orchestrating that challenge comes again. And when that spirit comes again, it comes with more temper and intensity. So this time around, you don't even have the energy to pray again. But if you were wise, you would have realized that prayer for you is an economy for a lifetime. That's why Jesus said, when an evil spirit is gone out of a man, it is not over. He said, it goes about in dry places, looking for where it will abode, not finding any, it returns. So the guy who was delivered may feel that the power of God was needed to deliver him. He may not realize that the power of God is supposed to become an eternal economy by which he operates every day of his life. So when he is delivered, he runs away from the presence of God and he goes back to business as usual. And Jesus said, when that demon comes back, it will come with seven more wicked demons. And he said, worse will be the state of that man than the beginning thereof. The next state of that man may be such that he may not even have need for deliverance anymore. He will not even contemplate deliverance. He will be lost eternally. So if that man was wise, he would begin to do business with the power of God every day of his life. So Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The key word in that scripture are two. One is what? Ought. That means prayer is not something we, we take advantage of to address a need. Prayer is part of our infrastructure. We were designed to be beings of prayer. So the moment we fail to pray, then the gate for challenges is opened in our lives. So the first thing Jesus was saying in that scripture was that the challenge of the widow came because she was not even praying in the first place. The moment challenge came, the widow now developed the strategy of troubling the judge. 
But if that widow understood the intelligence of fraternizing with the judge in the first place, she would not have a challenge. Because before the challenge would have come, her influence with that judge would have remediated the issue. So now she's bombarding the judge and exhausting all her energy to address a need that she was supposed to provide solution for. This is why many people who are supposed to be healers are walking the streets every day sick. When they become sick, then they begin to make demand on the healing anointing. Meanwhile, they are supposed to be dispensers of the healing virtues of God. So Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And secondly, the key word is always. That means you will pray when you have a problem and when you don't have a problem. Because the purpose of prayer is superior to having your needs met. Jesus was revealing to us that prayer as a divine economy was deeper than an infrastructure for just addressing your need. That means your need is the least thing that prayer is meant for. You may use prayer to address your need, but prayer is deeper than every need you will ever have in life. The purpose of prayer transcends your need. If you only pray to meet your need, then you have not understood the depths of prayer. So Jesus began to educate us that as men who are trapped in this mortal vessel, prayer for us will be a life. So he said, men ought. Before he began to talk about the woman, he went back to humankind. So long as you are a man, whether you have a challenge or not, he said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. So if you are not a man, then you are exonerated from prayer. But so long as you are a man, prayer for you is your life. The way you breathe oxygen, that is what the economy of prayer should be for you if you are a man. Men ought. So when a spirit begins to talk, it's important for you to settle down and meditate on his utterance because his utterances are deeper than the context he was is trying to address. You may look at that scripture and begin to edu educate yourself from the parable. What Jesus was talking about is deeper than the parable. If you are here and you are not praying, then you, you may be a, another kind of creature. You are not a man. You know, Apostle Alpha was telling us yesterday what it takes to be a man. But if the divine will consider you to be a man, one of the indicators in the heights of the heavens that will show that you are a man living on earth is the degree to which your prayer ascends to heaven. So if your prayer is not touching the heights of the heaven, God may think you are another creator. But so long as you are a man, he say what? Men ought. So if you are on earth and you are not praying, maybe you are an amoeba in heaven. But for heaven to see you as a man, the only thing that they will check, you know if you are alive, the doctor will check you by consciousness. When your consciousness is gone, they say you are in coma. They don't know whether you are going away from life or you are still here. So they call it coma. There is nothing the doctor can do for you. They just put you under life support. They will begin to work with you when consciousness resumes. So in heaven, one of the ways that heaven judges that you are still a man on earth is what? By prayer. So the Bible said something in Revelation chapter 5 verse 8. It said the prayers of the saints are sent to heaven as orders and they are stored up in golden vials. So every time a man prays, God stores it up in heaven. His needs are already met. But that prayer that ascends to heaven, God hears it as incense. They come as others. They are the fragrances of heaven. That God has a purpose on earth that mortal men are still accomplishing. So the only reason that will make you relevant in the height of Zion is that you are also providing aroma in heaven. And the Bible said those aromas are precious to God. So much so that he stores them up as others in golden vials. So even after you are dead and gone from this world, in heaven your name, your, your name on earth will still be resonating. This is why till tomorrow we still call the name of Abraham. Because of the kind of legislation that Abraham carried out, he became an eternal figure. Immortality is not just judged by your ability to live forever. Immortality is also judged by your relevance with God for eternity. So, so long as we live on this side of the divide, the name Abraham will be relevant because there is something that ascended to heaven and God stored it in golden bias. The reason a man will die and go away and be forgotten in heaven is because he doesn't have anything in the storehouse of heaven. You may have mansions on earth and cars and people will hail you. But when the spirit comes to check you, 
he will check how much volume of prayer do you have in heaven then you will discover that you are not considered as a man because what men ought always to pray and not to faint <laughs> <laughs> what if we decided the portrait of heaven is open now and then God begins to show us our figure some of us the last time our prayer went to heaven was one year ago when we wake up we say thank you father we are wearing tight to catch up with the office so we are creators of office our definition is based on our assignment in our office but the unfortunate thing is that those assignments are mundane those assignments does not sustain the capacity to journey with you through the portals of the great divide. When you die, your certificates, your credentials, and your record among men will end on earth. There are few things that can travel with your soul when you cross the veil. Because you don't have authority over your soul. There is a spirit that carries you through the veil of the divide. And that spirit carries few commodities with you. One of them is the quality of prayer that ascended with you as incense to heaven. It is possible for you to be reading in heaven while you are on earth. It depends on your echoes in Zion. That's why some men walk on earth like immortal entities. A man will come and say, so long as I live, there will be no rain or dew. And heaven backs it up. You don't know why. He is not only living on earth. He has infrastructures built in the heavens. So when he talks, heaven have no choice but to back him up. Jesus was walking in Nazareth. He said, the son of man which is in heaven. He has an account in heaven. And that account is robust. So when he speaks on earth, he's spending an account, and he's spending a currency from heaven. You think it's just to come and speak boldly. Go and talk boldly. And then you will sense the slap of a demon possessed. Because you don't have anything stored in the warehouse of heaven. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The reason one man can come to your family and end a plague that have killed 15 people. And it's like he's playing. is because he knows how to store data in heaven. You don't have data. So on earth you are just a man breathing. And your value is based on the breath on your nostril. But there are men like Abel that even after they died, they had so much stature that they could command the courts of heaven to listen to them. God said the voice of his blood is crying to me from the ground. You are alive, you are praying, heaven is not hearing. Heaven doesn't even know when you have a problem. But there's another man who even after he's dead, he could assemble the courts of heaven. The whole judge of all would have to intervene because he could not die. He was an immortal entity. He had done business with this spirit so much that even after oxygen was taken from his nostril, he was still alive. They understand the economy of immortality. They know how to store data in the heights of the heaven. Men ought never listen to a spirit and consider it by face value. <laughs> if you judge a spirit by face value, you have no understanding. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. It therefore means that even though we have to do everything we need to do to be relevant in time, there are economies that are higher than everything we know to do in time. A man must first of all become popular among spirits for him to rule among men. A man must first of all gain rank in heaven for him to have rank on earth. This is why a 10 year old witch can paralyze a professor. She is doing business in a higher plane. The professor may be a professor emeritus. He has taught in the university. He's a university dawn. But a week of 10 years comes. And she understands how to travel beyond time into eternity. So he does something and the professor becomes paralyzed. The professor can even be a neurosurgeon. He understands how the brain works. But he doesn't have the power to immobilize the nerve cells of the brain. Men ought. You are only invincible on earth. To the degree that you can stay in heaven. When the spirit speaks, discern that spirit correctly. Men ought. 
I want to show you four things this morning that I call higher purpose of praying. Because you can journey through this life and walk by your skill and technocracy. You can walk through life by human wisdom. And then you build something and after 35 years, you see a man that has a beautiful family. Sons graduating from the university after 35 years, you hear that they were driving home for Christmas and a trailer crushed them. Because he doesn't know how to store data in heaven. The devil was just waiting for him. He labored after 35 years. A trap was set for him 35 years before he got married. But he doesn't know how to enter into the future. Men of prayer don't die. They journey from time to eternity. They can determine what will happen to them on earth. They can shape things on earth. They can move the hand of God. They are never taken on away. Even if they die, it's because they submit themselves to it. That's why men like Paul will go to Jerusalem. He knew that he needed to bear testament before the king. So for him, that was his vent and a gateway into heaven. Things don't happen to them. They make things happen. Imagine how frustrating it will be for a man to labor for 35 years. And then you hear that him and his family are wiped away. Because a, a, a witch, a witch, sometimes it's even a, witch, a 10 year old witch, stood, in, stood on the road and then he stopped the front tire and the car from assaulting. A witch. You know what that witch may be doing? Maybe that's her IT. And then she came to do her IT on your family. That you labor to build for 35 years. A witch, IT, IT on your family. Men ought. <laughs> you don't know what I want to talk about. I was a preacher. I was popular and known. But every three years, a hawk came to my family and picked somebody. My mother died. My cousin died. My brother died. And I said, wait, what is this? And then God began to teach me priesthood intelligence. You pray for people, they are healed. You pray for things, they happen. But you don't have a surveillance over your family. Because your prayer is directed to needs. Your prayer is not an economy in heaven. The day you begin to pray as an economy, then you create a radar around your family. The devil will have no passageway anymore. And then this year, the same hawk came. And when the hawk came, we saw it in the spirit. And I tapped my friend. I said, come. And we stood up around 12. We began to pray. And an angel descended in the room. The angel was born in it. His everything about him was like a son. And then I knew judgment had come. And we released judgment. Two months later, the man died. He began to decay in his room. And before he died, two months later, he confessed. And he said, he killed my brother two years ago. That means the life of my brother was in my hand. But because I didn't understand priesthood, my brother fell off my hand. When I was crying and asking God why, God was the one asking me why. Because the purpose of that young man was in my hand, but I didn't know I was a priest. I will pray for things to happen, but I never knew that prayer was an economy that preserved the heritage of God in the life and in the family. The purposes of God will never be accomplished until men know how to fill the clouds of heaven with the dew of prayer. Because men ought always to pray and not to faint. This microphone I'm carrying today was an investment of my mother for more than 30 years. She kept me before the Lord. She said, this one will serve you. And many years later in the university, I met strange friends and they began to teach me the way of the club. The thing became worse when my mom died. And I said, I will become a bad boy. But you know what? My voice couldn't go to heaven. Her voice was already registered in heaven. And on the strength of her voice, there was a signature of my father. Even though I said I would be a bad boy, heaven couldn't hear that one anymore. Men ought. It was in the club when I was dancing that a, a light came out of the wall and arrested me like this. So I was carried to the altar. I didn't come here because I chose to serve God. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. Did you read about Jacob? The guy was a man of the senses, a man of the flesh. He was the custodian of the Abrahamic blessing. He lived for his appetite. But he was journeying and then he came to Bethel. And when his head touched the altar of Abraham, the heavens opened. He was arrested. The guy had no plan to serve God. 
but what men ought always to pray so abraham negotiated the destiny of his children on the altar of prayer so long as you are from the bloodline of abraham you have no choice but to serve god because men ought the altars of abraham will travel with you anywhere you go that altar will gather you back to the lord men ought always to pray when a spirit speak pray that you discern we spend hours in our offices you are in the office from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. You have 10 million in the bank. You think that is what life is about. You are a joker. May no demon do an IT on your family. Hey. You don't know the deeper meaning of life. May God help you. Let me tell you, the Bible said there is an evil day for every man. Because the devil is roaring. Moving like a roaring lion. Looking for whom to devour. The day when evil come, may God help you to have enough stature. Because he says if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because God is not on the throne. It's because your strength is small. Men ought. He said the prayers of the saints, they ascend to heaven as others. They are stored in golden fires. What is your storage in heaven? Men ought. Men ought. Men. May we not testify for something that the devil wants to use to ridicule us. May I not stand and testify about my daughter Whereas the devil has set a trap for her to become a harlot Because I don't know the intelligence of guiding her future Before my children are born I will tell them what they will do Did you read about Jacob? He said, gather around me you sons of Israel I will tell you the things that will befall you Why? He said, as a prince thou hast power with God and with men And hast prevailed So if Jacob tells his son He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. It doesn't matter where Judah lives. Anywhere he goes, he's a king among men. Anywhere, he's a king because a man of prayer has altered his destiny and the moment he speaks, the codings are documented in the heavens. Even the powers of the heavens will support him because the man spoke. Did you see when Isaac blessed Jacob? He said, I bless you with corn and wine. What about inflation? Inflation is not a factor because he has blessed him with the dew of heaven. Anywhere that guy goes, he will prosper. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Why would our children be wayward? We don't have stature in the spirit. You can wake up and tell your child that so long as you live, you will serve the Lord. And we have no choice. Because when you speak, the heavens, the heavens, the heavens, you mobilize angels. You mobilize the laws of the spirit realm. You mobilize nature. He can go to a harlot and the harlot will reject him. Because you say so long as you live, so long as, so long as you live, you will serve the Lord. Men ought always to pray. We don't know the economy of prayer. Things don't happen to men of prayer. You can stand up and tell your child, anywhere you go, you are a king. Your child may think it's luck. Anywhere he goes, people will serve him. Did you read? Oh, Jesus need to help us. Jesus need to help us. Men ought. Men ought. What is your prayer life like? So that you don't labor for 50 years. And then the wind comes from Hades. And sweep away your labor. And then you cry. You say, God, where are you? Jesus is a spirit. So he spoke from the depths of heaven. He said, men ought men ought men ought always to pray and not to fail this is how we shape the systems of the world this is how we preserve our destiny and we become invincible this is how we determine the destiny of nations we bet them in prayer the bible said in colossians 4 12 he said epaphras is one of you a born servant of christ laboring fervently for you in prayers laboring fervently for you in prayer that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So the reason the church of God was striving in Colos was not because of the pastors that were in Colos. It was because a man was at the back of the cave by the name Epaphras. So long as he was praying the believers in Colos will stand. Paul said, my little children of whom I travel again for you in prayers until Christ be formed. So Paul didn't need to preach so much to them. He created and bettered Christ in their spirit. Our children don't have any right to be evil. Our children have no right to be corrupt. 
If only we understand the intelligence of the author, men ought always to pray. Let me tell you, don't waste your time advising anybody. Because the things that manipulate human decision, they are born from the realm of the spirit. That's why a virgin can enter a university and in less, in, on the day of her matriculation, she's disflowered. A young man who is decent enters the university and is initiated into the world court on the day of his matriculation. Because he came under a radar. That university, there is an energy ambience in that university. There is a prince of immorality there. So the guy only had advice and advice was a rational, a rational thinking process that was formed in his soul. But he came to a place where there was an orchestration from the womb of the spirit. So the spirit, the energy he interacted with, the advice can't stand it. Because anything born in the spirit will overwhelm everything in your senses. This is why many go to the university they become harlots in 200 level. Because they are under an energy that they cannot, they cannot interact with. The energy controls them. It regulates their thinking process. It chokes them. Why do you think men go to Babylon and they become Babylonians? Only four men were Israelites in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with Daniel. The whole Israelite became Babylonians. Because those ones, they said they will not divide themselves by the king's will. They were consecrated to the altar. The Bible said in Daniel chapter 6 from verse 10, he said Daniel prayed three times in the day as his custom was. Men ought. You don't know the way of prayer. I tell you, you will be swallowed up because this world is a fallen creation. You are mighty on your throne. You may be seated. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign. Come on. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign. Come on. You are mighty on your throne. We just have ten minutes more. It's a body. It's a body. Because we are family men, let me show you one purpose of prayer. Hmm. This word belongs to the devil. I know somebody is surprised. <laughs> See, we are pilgrims in this world. You and I, we are pilgrims. We are ambassadors of heaven. And God sent us to this world to carry out a purpose which sent us around so many. This is not our word. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3, He called the devil the God of this world. Jesus on the mount of, 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 of the mountain of temptation, the devil came to him. He showed him the whole world and the beauty of the world. He said, bow to me and we give it to you because it has been delivered to me. Jesus never challenged the statement because that was the fact. He is in possession of the Adamic authority. So he has rulership over this world. This is why before God creates anything in this world again that has eternal scope, that thing must first of all be born from heaven. Everything in this world now that survives, its foundation is in heaven. Because anything that has its foundation on earth now, the devil can manipulate it. This is why somebody can give birth to a child and he was born deaf and dumb. In John chapter 9, they came to Jesus. They said, who seen that this man was born blind? Is he him or his parents? Jesus said, none of them. There is somebody that has authority to manipulate creation. In fact, the Bible said in Romans chapter 8 verse 19, that creation itself is in bondage. There is an authority that is ruling over this world now. The only way to survive in this world and to establish anything in this world to last forever is if you get it from heaven. From the fall, that was the only way God began to institute systems in the world. As spiritual as starting a ministry is, if it is not revealed from heaven, if you do it, it will collapse. The devil will choke it, you will frustrate until you run away. That's why many pastors become swindlers. Because it may look spiritual, but it will not survive. The same thing with your family. Start a family because you think the lady is from a where to do home, and then they are disciplined, they are godly, they are this. After 10 years, you will cry for love. And most people that did that already know what I'm talking about. Our foolish generation, we want to marry, we see the girl, she's tall, she has shape. <laughs> you are judging from the natural. And you don't know the beings manipulating the earth. They are sitting in the heavenlies. 
until you are able to pick something higher than the realm where those guys dwell, it will not survive. Everything God is building now that has eternal foundation, it came from heaven. In Genesis chapter 6, from verse 5 to verse 18, the Bible revealed to us what God wanted to do when he wanted to start the new world with Noah. The Bible said God gave him the pattern of the ark from heaven. There were many boats on earth. All of them sank. Noah was not the first to create an ark. There were many other arks. All of them sank. The only ark that floated on the water was the one that its dimension was given from heaven. So the ark will not float on the water because boats float on water. The ark will only float on the water because the dimensions came from heaven. God wanted to create a place of worship. In Exodus chapter 25, Chapter 40, verse 25, and verse 9. And, ve and, verse, and verse, verse 40, right? Exodus 25, verse 9, and verse 40. He told Moses, he said, Build the ark according to the pattern that was revealed to you from the mount. Don't just go and build a house because it's a covering. I'm not looking for a covering. For this thing to survive, you must get it from heaven. Anything that doesn't come from heaven now does not survive in time. When God wanted to start the church as spiritual as the church is because Jesus knew that the gate of hell will fight it. Because in this world now, we are on a battlefield. There was no way Jesus could start the church. He carried the people around. There was no way. Because the church will only have his foundation from heaven for it to survive. And he gathered. He said, who do men say I, the son of man, I am? Matthew chapter 18 verse 16 to 18. He says, some say you are Elias. Some say you are Jeremiah. Some say you are Isaiah. Some say you are one of the prophets. Ah, no wonder there was no church on earth again. And he said, you, who do you say I am? And Peter spoke. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Quickly, Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And immediately Jesus said, upon this revelation... I will build my church. For the first time, I have seen a foundation that came from heaven. I can build the church now. And he said, the gate of hell will not prevail. So the reason the gate of hell will not prevail is because the foundation came from the spirit. The same thing applies to your family. If your family has no foundation from the spirit, there is crisis. Because the house, the foundation will be like quicksand. And when the winds come, you will be amazed. This is why men pray. We pray so that everything God commits to our hand, as we come into time, we can receive the blueprint from Zion. Because only then will it survive. And if we don't find it, there will be crisis. It was after Noah came out from the ark that we understood how Noah was able to get the pattern. You know, the Bible just said in Genesis chapter 6, from verse 5 down, it said, Noah found grace with God. And you think because he was grace, he went to build the ark. When he came out, immediately the Bible said he erected an altar. He erected an altar. When we talk about Moses, again and again he went to the mountain in prayer. That was where they got those things from. Men ought. If you don't pray, everything you build is on quicksand. The reason it may be thriving now is because the devil don't have your time yet. In this life, eh, there is a level you can never cross unless a spirit aids you. Start a business. You think business is about hard work and excellence. There's a threshold you get to a spirit will appear to you because there are gatekeepers for every level in this life. There is a level of fame you cannot have until a spirit appear to you. There are many people doing the same business in this world. Only few break through. They know how to fraternize with spirits. There's a level your family cannot get to until you know how to fraternize with a spirit. Even this message, gospel we are preaching. We are all preachers. And all of us are preaching the word of God. But few are known. I preached for 13 years. It was in 2019 that God came to me and said, I will begin to announce you. Is it not the same message I'm preaching? For 13 years, we were on every social media platform. We were posting things. Nobody looked at it. <laughs> the same strategy. We were now applying it and then you drop one message online. You see 23,000 views. I released six messages on the 1st of March. On the 14th of March, I had contact from 17 nations of the world. What happened to the 13 years? Because the spirit came and said, I will begin to announce you. 
Because when a spirit begins to fraternize with you, then even the elements of creation begin to back you up. Did you read about the four lepers? Four people that their ankles and nails are eating up. They are trekking to the camp of the enemy and the enemies were hearing sounds of chariots. Because a spirit was announcing their arrival. So what the enemies were hearing were chariots. When God wants to announce you, if you cough in your room, they will hear a trumpet in America. <laughs> the same job. You hear when daddy gave his testimony. They invited 40 people, one didn't come for no just cause. And then of all that were applying, they say, you bring your own now. And then he that was the last to be recruited became the head of the class. You think life is coincidence. <laughs> Men ought. Men ought. Let me tell you. Study and study very well. But don't jump on a job because there is an opportunity. Some of my friends, when we didn't have enough understanding, we were all laboring. One was picked for short service in 2013. It was in the training ground that he fell from a mountain and died. What you will call a blessing. Don't jump at things because of opportunity. That's how the natural man thinks. A spiritual man moves because his steps are ordered by the Lord. But you cannot sense the move of the spirit until you make the altar your dwelling place. It's, a, it's, it's an error to spend more time on anything in this world than prayer. Because the blueprint of your life, they are on the mountain. Your advantage is on the mountain. Your strength is on the mountain. Everything you do, you will labor for many years. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. Never take advantage of your talent. It's until a spirit breathes upon it. That's when it will count. We were orators for many years, talking big grammar. All we had were hand claps. But now, somebody heard my message. And she had a six minutes message and she transferred 530,000 naira to me from another country. The same message I was preaching and people were clapping. Somebody heard it for six minutes and sent me half a billion because a spirit had breathed on it. I came to this place. I didn't have a message this morning. I just stood here and I was trusting God. You know, we are not teachers. A teacher can prepare a message because God told him the challenge of the people. And then he prepares a teaching because they build men. We set men on fire. So we need to connect to heaven to download what God is saying part time. So even while I came to this church this morning, I didn't have a message. I was here, I told my friend, God needs to help. Better be praying. And then when the sister came out and she was worshipping, suddenly the heavens opened and I said, oh, this one is anointed. See, that's why we know anointed people. It's not melody that creates anointing. It is the supply of the spirit. When she began to worship, Instantly the heavens opened and what I'm telling you now began to download in my spirit. It began to download in my spirit. It began because somebody was singing at the choir. Hey, you don't know how the spirit realm works. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Just in case you don't have a job description, I'm giving you one this morning. Make prayer your life and then your life will become invincible. Jesus said, as the wind bloweth, thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He says, so are they that are born of the Spirit of God. You want to be invincible in this realm? Then prayer must become your life because your advantage is on the mountain. There are many forces in this world that can manipulate even the tides of nature. When Job was attacked, wind came from nowhere, fire the devil has the power to manipulate nature, you can submit a contract for 10 years and the devil will make them not to see your fire for you to have an advantage in time you must become a creature of prayer, men ought always to pray and not to fail, for those of us who are young it's easier, so that you don't journey in the wrong direction, it may take you many years of delay to get back you know, two weeks ago, I was driving from Asokoro. I wanted to go to uh, Wusezo too. Somehow, I was approaching the roundabout. I was using the, how do you call it now? Uh, Google app. All this, this is their Google Navigator or Google app. And then the, the lady talking, the program, the program voice, now said, you get to the roundabout in 200 meters, take the second turn by the right. And then I entered the first turn. Lo and behold, I found myself in Wuyi. <laughs> A journey of 15 minutes now took 25 minutes because the app needed to renavigate. Sometimes the reason you are delayed so much in your life is because God is trying to renavigate. You missed God five days ago, so He's taking another five years of renavigation. 
Don't waste your life by living by chance. He said the, he said the step of the righteous is ordered by the Lord. But your step cannot be ordered until you can see into the spirit. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. This is my charge for you this morning. Can we bow our heads and ask God to open the heavens over our lives? There are whispers you need to hear from Zion that will constitute your advantage in time. And until you hear those whispers, your life may not come. Kenneth Hagin was a preacher for 13 years until Jesus came to him after 13 years and told him you just entered the first phase of your prophetic call. So that 13 years, what was he doing? What was he doing? There is so much to conquer in this world. We cannot afford to live by chance. We need a clear cut direction of the Holy Spirit. But the only way we can plug in is by subscribing to the prescription of the mortal spirit that spoke in time. He said, man, ought always to pray and not to fail. Talk to Jehovah. Hmm. Hmm. When I looked around the happenings in the lives of men, I discovered the only true advantage we have in time is the advantage of the spirit. I have seen millionaires crash after many years of labor. I have seen families wasted on the street after many years of love and affection. Beauty. I have discovered the only advantage you have as a mortal man in the realm of time is the economy of prayer that you subscribe to that brings you to a height in the mountains of Zion. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. What is your prayer quota? What are you storing in heaven? When you speak, is there an echo in the mountains of God? The Bible said the prayers of the saints, it ascends to heaven as others. They are stored up in golden fires so that once and again, God can make reference to it. Some of us, the prayer we pray is the reason why the lady cannot be raped. Because there is something stored in heaven and God can draw from it and it will still be just. Some of us, the reason somebody will not die by accident is because our, our prayers are sended as order. So on the economy of our prayer, God can intervene in an accident. God can intervene in a robbery because we have data in heaven. This is why the mightiest of men may not be the ones on the stage. The intercessors that have no name among men who are hidden by the caves in heaven. When the saints march in, you will be shocked. The great men that we call generous in heaven. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. Men ought always to pray and not to fail. Kamara hasafaliana talias shalibranda sombra katalila rahaski. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to be deeper in love. Deeper than I've ever been before. Jesus, I want to know you more than this. How I long to be deeper in love. There is a longing that only you can feel. A raging tempest that only you can steal. Please pray, please pray. My heart is thirsty, Lord, to know you as I've known. To drink from the fountain. Flows before your throne. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Bless Jesus.
Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Please take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to get deeper. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for showing us your ways again. We give you glory. We give you glory. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, mighty name, we are prayed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. See, until you start growing in God, you will not understand how relevant it is, what you have neglected for so long. The only reason why you'll be relevant is when you subscribe to what heaven has said. What's the message again this morning? Men ought always to what? Man of God. God bless you, sir. Apostle Michael Rocco. Please put your hands together. I told 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 I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.